Hello, guys. Welcome to our show, marketers. Welcome, good people. Welcome. By the way, I don't want to discriminate bad people. Welcome to our show as well. Anyone who wanna learn more about marketing, about customer behavior, welcome because it's very important today to satisfy users, customers, and get results. That's why I'm so excited to discuss this topic with Kevin Hillstrom. How are you? I am happy. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, uh, I think you know uh, today Monday. I don't know uh, exactly when this podcast will be released, but you know I love Monday. I love this day because you know if you have your loving job, it doesn't matter. Monday, Tuesday, Friday evening, uh, night, morning. So it's better to love your job, Kevin. Before we start, just tell more about yourself, experience, background, uh, and why you pay attention to marketing and customer behavior. So my name is Kevin Hillstrom, and I have been in the field of analytics for 35 years. Um, my background is really uh, retail oriented. So I worked in the catalog industry back in the 1990s. I worked at retail brands like Eddie Bauer and Nordstrom. And for the last 16 years, I've run my own consulting agency where I help CEOs understand how customers interact with marketing. So uh, mar analytics is really my passion. And I like the intersection of you spend X number of dollars on advertising and it causes a certain number of customers to purchase. And those customers have a specific behavior downstream. That's kind of my area where I really enjoy working. Nice, nice. Love it, love it. Awesome. Yeah, huge experience. Uh, Kevin, can you tell what changed uh, in digital marketing marketing for all these years because you started before digital and right now we have digital marketing and uh, I saw some shifts uh, during the way because uh, in the first, uh, I mean like in the beginning of digital marketing, uh, many companies uh, thought how to satisfy uh, search engines, social media, but today I see the shift to customers, to customer behavior, to help them, to support, to provide value as much as possible. So can you tell uh, what works today in digital marketing? I, I think what, what I have seen over the past uh, 25 years is over that period of time, customers have become, how should I say, less loyal. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, if, if you went back to 1998, a customer only had a handful of choices of companies that they could purchase from. And so you had a customer base that was pretty loyal and pretty predictable. Um, fast forward to 2023, it's not like that. A customer has a nearly infinite number of buying choices and they've got the, the highly um, sticky choices like an Amazon where you have a prior relationship with Amazon, you have all of your data there. Um, you can purchase something and have it delivered to your house within four hours. Uh, and so when you have a competitor like Amazon there, it is much more difficult for a company to break through and a company to be able to keep their customers. So if I go back 25 years ago, one of my clients would have had maybe four out of 10 of last year's customers purchase again in the next year, which is a pretty normal rate. Now it's maybe two or three out of 10 customers will purchase again next year. So what, what you're dealing with is a constant situation where you don't have a lot of customers who are loyal who are coming back to you. And from a digital marketing standpoint, it's like my clients have to execute a lot of campaigns over a lot of channels just to get 25 out of 100 customers to purchase again. And most of their efforts are really catering towards prospects who haven't purchased before to convince somebody to purchase. So my clients who have success with digital marketing tend to have success in areas where they have what I would call a hook. They have something about them that causes a customer to prefer them over anybody else. And if you don't have that little extra something it doesn't really matter what your digital marketing efforts are because you're going to just be you're going to be lost in a sea of sameness with all the other other customers or I'm sorry all the other companies you could be purchasing from. So you have to have something that causes you to stand out. 
And if you don't have that something to stand out, the digital marketing efforts are going to be less likely to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree because I often see when companies replicate competitors, you know, they see how competitors get sales, uh, provide marketing campaigns and do the same. But if you uh, don't stand out from the rest, if you don't search for another way how to market your products, you can fail because competitors usually use their strong side. Uh, we need to consider our unique selling proposition and our strong side. Uh, I want to ask you about how to create a buying persona because, you know, I remember when I started uh, my first uh, Google Ads campaign, Facebook Ads campaign, uh, I didn't consider buying persona because I paid for a click like uh, five, ten cents. Today, I can't. I can't. I need to know uh, exactly who is my customer because I need to pay for click five, ten dollars. It's a lot. So can you tell how to create a buying persona? So every everybody has a different way that they approach this. With my clients, I like to look at what customers purchase. So in other words, um, you know, you're wearing a set of headphones right now. Um, certain people like that over the ear headphone, some people like uh, open air headphones, some people like the earbuds, right? So the, right there, you've basically got three types of customers and they're all a little bit different based off of their headphone preference. For most of my clients, they sell anywhere from 500 products to a million products. I like to break down what products fit together and come up with basically six or nine or 12 different groupings of customers who tend to like specific product categories. So they all tend to buy the similar things. So in other words, somebody might buy a pair of headphones and have a head headphone amp. Those people are going to be different than somebody who has earbuds and uses it with, the, with a, a mobile phone. So I break things up by what it is that you buy. And then I look for any demographic information or any lifestyle information that correlates with those different buying clusters. And based off of that, I work with the executive team or the marketing team with the client to basically come up with a handful of personas. And so once you know that um, Tom is a persona and Tom likes over the ear headphones and likes a headphone amp, and their interest is really listening to good music, that person, Tom, has a different marketing cadence, a different type of messaging that goes to Tom than somebody like Kevin who might have earbuds and typically use it uh, maybe to do Zoom calls or something like that. So it's, it's, it's really, the for me, with my clients, it's the product that you buy paired with how you use that product determines what the persona is. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. By the way, I can tell why I'm using big uh, headphones. You know, it's not because of battery. It's not because of sound because uh, small headphones have the same quality, but you know, it's hard to lose them. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, many times I lost my uh, earbuds. I don't know where to find them so to search so i decided to buy big ones so i, I often see them okay uh, of course we have some advantages because of battery like uh, plus 55 uh, hours yeah that's good okay kevin let's uh talk about getting this data you mentioned that you uh fall in love in analytics you uh learn data and before uh, creating marketing message you collect data Tell your practical way how to get the right data and choose the right one. Because, you know, uh, I spoke with a few uh, data experts and many of them uh, told me that over data hurts more than getting enough data. And once I watched interview with Jeff Bezos and he told, um, you know, that was interview about uh, when he got data about uh, new product. Uh, and the research team asked to give more time to collect data, but he denied. He told, guys, it's enough. We have enough data. It's better to experiment, test, and find it out. And this product called Alexa, today almost all comp uh, homes in the US have this product. And uh, can you tell how to find the balance between enough data, over data, uh, less data, 
and uh, your practical way how to collect it. So it, everybody's going to give you a different answer. Um, yeah, I know. I, I like first party data. So whatever it is that my client is able to collect on their own is what I prefer to look at. I typically get 90% of the value from a client from really from three things. Um, what the customer buys, the marketing channel they buy it from, and any website or mobile site activity that is important. So, um, so, so in other words, I, I can collect what page a customer views when they visit one of my client's websites. I can collect all that information. I have found over the course of the last 25 years, very little. Oh. So what I'm trying to always accomplish is... Um, with what it is that you bought, I'm summarizing by how often you buy it and um, uh, essentially how often you buy it and what quantity you buy it in. And I age the data so that data that was that happened a year or two or three years ago has a half-life and it's worth half as much or one-fourth as much or one-eighth as much. So older data gets aged quickly. Recent data counts for a lot. Uh, on a website, you know, pur purchase data has maybe a 12-month half-life. Your website data might have a one-week half-life. So whatever it is that you did this week counts for 100%. What you did last week counts 50%. What you did two weeks ago counts 25%. I weight that online data accordingly as well. And nice. I have found that if you get the weighting correct, and it's typically the more digital the information is, the less long that data has relevance. So it has a very quick half-life. When you buy something that has a very long half-life, that means something. Spending $200 is a commitment. And so as a result, that data tends to stick with the customer and influence how the customer behaves going forward. So I am waiting what you bought. I'm waiting what you did online. Uh, I'm waiting the marketing channels you interact with. And then I basically have in my data set, I have spending levels and I've got indicators that tell me what, what you bought, what you what channels you bought from and what activities you've done online. Those indicators all work together then. And they I don't need a lot of information. I might only need, if you think about it in terms of a spreadsheet, I, you're only really thinking about maybe you know 30 or 40 columns of data. So I have these very long and thin data sets that might have a hundred million rows and have 40 columns in it. And that's the information I'm slicing and dicing to give my clients advice and tell them what to do. Nice, nice. I see you uh, have t-shirt, Puma, you know, uh, for example, it's interesting when my son uh, usually asks me to buy new t-shirt, he often uh, names brands, you know, like Nike, Adidas, I don't know where he can get all this information, but he names brands all the time. Uh, and uh, he doesn't ask me to buy new sneakers. He asked me to buy Nike. <laughs> so yes. can you tell about competing with big brands? You know, it's hard. It's hard. For example, uh, in paid marketing, in organic reach, big brands have power, uh, authority, trust. Uh, uh, but uh, small brands, if they have high quality products, they need to win customers as well. So uh, can you provide any tips how to do it? Well, so my, I have clients that are basically startups. And mm -hmm. if they were going to compete against a large brand, they have to have something that they do that causes a customer to think that they are unique and more unique than Nike, who has spent billions of dollars building a reputation. So you're going to have to have something that you do this clever. I, I once had a client that said that they put a ghost in every package that they ship to the customer. So they, they, I mean, obviously there's not a ghost in the package, but that's what they would say. And then they would put a little note in the package that's saying that this is your ghost. His name is Charlie. And he was in the package. Now that you've opened the package, the ghost is in your house. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was a way for them to be cute and clever and to generate attention and word of mouth. 
So we would watch then as customers would get their packages and then go on social media and talk about the, the we got the, the ghost that we got in our package was Charlie. Did anybody else get one? And somebody else would get one and said our ours was named Kevin. And somebody else would get one and said their name name was Henry. And by having that little hook, that little bit of difference that caused them to be different, they were able to grow and get to $10 million in annual sales, which is what their um, executive team wanted to get to to be happy because then that means that they were profitable enough that they could achieve their objectives. So th there, there has to be something that you do that is clever and unique and human that causes customers to want to talk about you and then causes your digital marketing efforts to build upon that. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Uh, you know, I want to ask you about uh, a new trend, probably not trend like regular tool, AI, because you have this experience, 25 years in digital marketing, huge experience. And uh, but during your experience, I don't know if you used AI or not, because big companies started to use AI like in 2015, Google uh, launched uh, a few, uh, the first algorithm today, or oh, everyone can use AI. So it's a big opportunity. Can you tell how to use AI in the smart way? I mean, like, because I see when uh, companies overuse AI to create generic information, uh, non-creative marketing message. So your tips how to find the right prompts and use in a smart way. I, um, this goes back to like 1994. Um, we had a vendor come in when I worked at Land's End and they promoted neural networks as a way of deciding which customers you should market to. And so they had multi-layer perceptrons that figured out. And, and, and so basically the math is not altogether different than what a lot of the math is that's being used in AI today. And so any time where my clients are able to use something to automate a process that is cumbersome, that's probably a pretty good use case for that. Uh, so, so in other words, I, I have clients that will use AI to write copy. Um, I, I have one, one, one individual I work with, they, they create surveys and they have found that AI can be used to write 10 times as many survey questions that are, re so they, in other words, they have a person who looks at, a human being looks at the survey question generated by AI and then says, is this a question that makes sense or not? If it is, go ahead and they will test it. They're able to test 10 times as many messages as they were able to test otherwise. They then use their humans to do the analysis and to basically decide um, what as a company they need to release to the public and what kind of intelligence they learn. But they're using the AI to do the cumbersome manual stuff that uh, humans are just not thrilled with doing or it's expensive for you to hire enough people to do. So that, that's, that's my opinion is anything that is a repetitive task today, um, that's a good candidate for, AI is a good candidate for that. Um, I don't think any of us can envision what things will be like even one year from now. And so to kind of project where something is going to head, I don't think is reasonable at this time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, many marketers criticize AI because it's not like human touch, without emotions, not creative. I agree, completely agree. And let me share a story about Lloyd Richardson. He published a book 11 years ago. Uh, uh, by the way, he spent like 14 years to write this book. So many years he wrote this book, then he published. And after 11 years of marketing and sales, uh, he got some sales, but not good, you know, not enough. Then his daughter posted content on TikTok from account with zero followers about this book. Uh, this video became viral. Plus 50 million people watch this video. Of course, I watch this video. <laughs> I'm curious what kind of video you can film to get 50 million views. Today, this book is bestseller on Amazon. Uh, so one simple video beats marketing, sales methods, uh, because this video is creative. You know, it's not like, uh, like nice looking design, simple design, nothing special, but that was creative. That was interesting. You know, after watching this video, I got curiosity. What kind of book is this if offer spent 
14 years to write this book. Wow, I want to read it, you know. Uh, so can you tell about creativity? How to be creative in your marketing? Because uh, most marketers, uh, uh, most uh, uh, customers ignore. Yeah, generic campaigns, the same. Uh, it's boring. Uh, so any tips about to become creative in your marketing? Um, so I wouldn't quit when something doesn't work. So uh, th there was an in there's a comedian that I look I follow online and he he started creating these TikTok videos and he would have maybe 600 or 700 people view them and he tried different content and he tried it for like six or nine months somewhere in that range and was and he got up to maybe 2,000 people viewing each video and then he um, he did a video series where he pretended that he was a podcaster and he. Would like and not 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 a podcaster, um, a, a podcaster who would basically have a large audience, like a radio broadcaster, okay. Mm -hmm. And he he did these little fifty second clips, pretending to be this expert, talking about topics, and then getting the topic completely wrong. But because he was a radio broadcaster slash podcaster, he had credibility, so he could basically say these 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 things where he didn't even know what he was talking about. And it would look like he was smart when he really wasn't smart. He went from 2000 views up to 5.1 million views in about two weeks. And so nice. he was being creative and everything he was trying did not work. It took, you know, two thirds of a year for him to find the one thing that people would like. And then all of a sudden that worked. So, so I would, when you're being creative, nine out of 10 things you do will not work. You know, I, I come up with new products for my client base and four out of every five products I come up with don't do well. And I will promote them. I, I, I put three or four months of effort into it. And four months later, I have, you know, I, I've hired six clients to work on, on those projects. And it's not enough for me to be profitable the way I want to be profitable. Uh, right now, I'm working on a project and it's very, very positive. And I was being creative in how I spoke to people. So in other words, I got feedback online from a person who said I had become a curmudgeon, which means I had become a grumpy old man. And he said, could you try being optimistic and positive and see what would happen? So I, I, I decided to, to take this person's advice. And for two months, I was optimistic and kind. I lost subscribers. I didn't have a single client hire me in those two months. So it was terrifying because I'm doing what this person suggested and I'm trying to be a nice person and I'm getting no business. And it took the third month when I kind of came up with an idea and was able to sell it and communicate it in a positive way that all of a sudden everything worked. So if I had given up after two months, I never would have gotten to the third month where it worked. So when you're being creative, you have to realize that almost everything you try is going to fail. And it's going to take some time for you to come up with a rhythm and come up with a way of doing something that resonates with people that they appreciate and they're willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like consistency and testing. You know, if you are not consistent, I don't know how you can <laughs> create something meaningful. For example, if I write uh, the first article, uh, I think uh, if you create any piece of content the first time, you know, it's useless. Yes. Nobody is interested about that. But when you acquire experience, yeah, you can uh, improve a little bit, slightly, step by step. I, you remind me, Mr. Beast, you know, he posted video on YouTube for an year and a half. So 18 months, he posted videos to get first thousand subscribers. Today, everyone knows Mr. Beast, you know, everyone knows because plus 120 million subscribers. So yeah, uh, he didn't give up and uh, I found one way how uh, not to give up. The best way, you need to love what you do. You know, for example, <laughs> if you, uh, I love playing ping pong, basketball, nobody pays money for that. Nobody is watching how I can play, but I love it. You know, I enjoy the process. It's the same with creating content. If you enjoy the process, then do it. And don't care about best practices. For example, if if you are not good with filming and uh, don't like it, write. Uh, I don't know, uh, draw design 
anything. Find your format and enjoy the process. It's very important. Yes. Kevin, yeah, I have the question about uh, how to, uh, you know, I remember one quote. I don't remember the offer of this quote, but the meaning like uh, uh, half of marketing budget is wasted. It's a pity that we don't know which half, you know. So can you tell how to create the right marketing budget? I mean, like, for example, okay, I can share like 10,000 for uh, SEO, 50,000 for uh, pay-per-click. And uh, I mean, like, okay, we, we need to waste. That's okay. It's part of the process. But how to minimize wasting money in marketing budget? <laughs> so what? I have found working with my clients over the decades is um, your marketing budget has a diminishing rate of return. So in other words, if you spend $100,000, you might get $300,000 in sales in, in, within a marketing channel, okay? That if you spend $200,000, you will not get another $300,000 in sales. You will probably get another $120,000 in sales. And so if you spend another $100,000 after that, you will probably get an extra $70,000 in sales. So what I just mapped out there is a law of diminishing returns. Every dollar you spend gets you more sales, but at an ever lowering rate. That relationship is the first piece that you really need to know to set your marketing budget. So with, with that relationship, you now know um, if I spend X, I'm going to get a certain amount of sales. 40%, let's say those sales are going to flow through to profit after you remove all the expenses. And then you subtract your advertising cost and you have a, a level of profitability. You take the amount of profit, you divide it by the number of customers you got. You have a profit per order or a profit per customer. So profit per customer is exactly the same thing as uh, cost to acquire a customer. They're the two metrics are basically identical. They're just on a different scale. One of them takes it to profit. One of them doesn't. But you, what you want to do is you want to figure out how much profit you got for every customer who bought. And then you want to know how much that customer pays you back over time. So if you spent, if you lost $20 of profit to acquire a customer, and you generate $30 of profit from that customer in their first year with you, you have a good relationship. So even though you were unprofitable to acquire the customer, you made enough money after one year and you will continue to make money after years two, three, four, five, keep spending the money. You will have other instances where you lose $20 to acquire the customer and the customer only pays you back $15 over time. That's a terrible relationship. And that's the relationship you don't want to have. So what happens is you actually want a uh, return on ad spend or a ROAS that is probably in the 2 to $3 range. It's a low number. It's usually from digital markers, they won't accept the rate that's that low. But that rate is good enough to cause you to lose money to acquire the customer and then generally make that money back up within one to two years and then generate profit from the customer thereafter. And that's kind of the process my clients go through to set a marketing budget. That once you know the relationship and this diminishing returns curve, you are able to then set up a budget and it's reasonably optimized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Kevin, I'm interested about creating the right strategy because I see when companies have no strategy. I mean, like they have generic strategies, but not documented. Just, I don't know, uh, simple analysis, uh, simple Google spreadsheet without deadlines, without many, many metrics, you know, just vanity metrics like volume, like uh, likes, comments. But uh, I don't care about traffic because if I get traffic and I can't sell with this traffic, it's useless, you know, for me. So can you tell how to create the right strategy by analyzing metrics that will help in the end? So the first thing I do with my clients is I calculate what percentage of last year's customers purchased again the following year. That metric almost always dictates what the strategy should be for our client. So if you are in a situation where 
you had 100 customers last year and 30 of them will purchase again this year, you need 70 customers to replace them. You are a customer acquisition centric company. And all of your strategies should be on customer acquisition and finding inexpensive ways to acquire customers if you want to grow. Eight out of 10 of my clients are in that situation. And so the strategy is really quite simple for them. They need to recalibrate all their marketing efforts away from customer loyalty, and they need to focus on acquiring customers at an inexpensive cost. And that might mean that they're going to have to have um, the creative tactics that we talked about. They're going to have to have creative tactics that cause a customer who's never bought before to be willing to try the company. And so mm -hmm. that then sets up basically the vision for what that company has to accomplish in the next year and dictates what the marketing department is going to work on. And then the marketing department has to find the products that sell really well to customers who are buying for the first time. And the marketing department has to feature those products and has to sell those products in a way that a prospect is willing to try that. So that is really the case for eight out of 10 of my clients. Um, I rarely have a client, and there aren't many companies like this, where customers are loyal. So if you worked for a department store in a mall, you might be able to retain 70% of last year's customers. And if the customer purchases, they're going to purchase six times. That is a completely different business model. Um, if a customer goes to Starbucks for coffee, that customer is going to Starbucks sometimes twice a day. That is a very different business model. And so now loyalty programs and finding ways to get you to buy six times a week instead of five, those things become important. For the average customer who's buying this shirt, that is not the world they operate in. And so those companies need to be constantly finding new customers. So knowing that annual repurchase rate for me dictates how I advise the company on what they need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, valuable. Uh, let's talk about loyalty. Uh, I think, you know, I, I check out a few studies uh, that uh, acquiring new customer costs five times more than uh, retaining existing customers. Can you tell how marketing can help to retain, to keep customers? Because I think, uh, of course, high quality product is a must have. But uh, if we have high quality product, how marketing can help to keep customers longer? I'm not convinced that it is marketing's job to keep customers longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, if I buy this shirt, my need has been met by buying this shirt. And so if I love this shirt, I may come back and purchase again. It's marketing's job to feature products to me that are similar to this shirt so that I've been tempted to buy that again. So it's been my experience that marketers are really good at merchandise personalization. So not, not like email personalization where you say, hi, Kevin, we realize you just bought this shirt. Please take 20% off on your next purchase. That, that I'm not talking about that kind of thing, but um, customers who bought this shirt also like another 10 or 12 items. The marketer can basically present those items to the customer and that helps the customer. In all of my work, I have rarely found instances where marketers are able to cause a customer to buy more often. It is incredibly hard to, so for instance, if I'm going to spend $200 a year on shirts, there's no way that a marketer is gonna get me to be able to spend $500 a year on shirts. My, my budget is set and I'm probably just going to spend that much money. So it's going to be important for me to, as a marketer, to present good merchandise to the customer and then kind of let that go and then go and find a new customer. All right. I'm still here if you can hear me.
I'm sorry, I lost my time. <laughs> so we can continue, Kevin. Okay, I, uh, you're a little bit choppy right now, but I can still see you. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what happened, but I lost connection, internet connection for some. Uh, I'll. That. <laughs> yeah, it's it's still happening. I think. Yeah, and uh, can can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you, but your video is frozen. Ah, that's okay. It's uh, Kevin. Uh, I have the question about um, future will be in digital marketing, and uh, how marketers can adapt today to this possible future. All right, could you repeat the question? Because it did it did cut out. All right, are you still there? Oh. Yeah, one more time. <laughs> uh, uh, what kind of future will be in digital marketing? What kind of future will it be in digital marketing? Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, it's my, my opinion that so much of digital marketing is going to be automated by AI that it's really, it, it's, it's going to be difficult for a human being to have like a strong presence in digital marketing. So I, I'm going to give you an example. I had a um, chief executive officer call me and he told me that he is looking to automate his entire marketing department so that he does not have a marketing department. He envisions that he will come into work. He will have, um, he will have service providers and he will have AI basically making all of his decisions for him. So the creative will be done by AI. The optimization of his marketing budget will be done by AI. Um, and he'll have agencies executing digital marketing tactics for him. And it's just going to be his job just to make sure that the sales are sufficient and profit is good. Um, I don't know that he'll ever be able to achieve his vision, but some version of that is coming. And it kind of means that the digital marketer and the analyst who analyzes all of this is going to have to become good at kind of putting together the whole story of how a customer behaves. Because it's going to be difficult for technology to tell you how a customer behaves in totality. It's going to be easy for technology to tell you slivers of activity. You know, so you'll you'll, you'll have a dashboard that tells you that uh, customers... Um, had a 2.04% conversion rate and they responded to this version of creative today and you should do X. But that tells you what worked today at nine o'clock AM. It doesn't tell you what's the right strategy for your business. So I think a digital marketer is going to have to take a step out of what they have been doing and focus a little bit more on where a company is headed or giving advice to a brand on where that company should go uh, as opposed to being in into so much detail and so much analysis. And uh, Kevin, my final question about your experience. You know, uh, uh, I have some students in my network who are looking for ways how to learn digital marketing from scratch. And you have this experience 25 years. It's a lot. And many things change during this time. So let's imagine if you started today, from scratch, what will you do today to learn more about digital marketing? If I was starting from scratch today, I probably would start some version of my own business. So what I mean by that is, it, it might be I might be um, it might be content, it might be uh, uh, a, a small amount of merchandise where I'm selling uh, ten products or something, um, and it's going to be my job to grow my business selling those 10 products or selling content. Um, I'm going to do everything I can hands-on so that I get to experience it as opposed to reading what somebody else did. Uh, I, I, I really feel like the hands-on experience and learning the stuff for yourself is more valuable than going to a resource and learning what that resource did and trying to copy that. Um, so, so for instance, for my own business, there are very few people that I can go and, and follow their model and have success with. I have to kind of experiment on my own. So e even if I'm um, creating content, I'm selling mugs with the content and I've got five mugs, 
I'm going to analyze the living daylights out of what caused the traffic to come in, what which of those five mugs sold the best, which customers who bought those mugs are going to be more likely to buy them again in the future. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Kevin, it's a big pleasure to speak with you on my show. Well, it was wonderful to be here. I appreciate that you had me. Connection again. <laughs> But Kevin, I just want to ask the last question. How people can reach out to you? How can they can follow you? Uh, the best way how to stay in touch. <laughs> Probably the best way to find me is on Twitter. I'm at MindThatData, M-I-N-E-T-H-A-T-D-A-T-A.com. Or you can go to my blog, blog.mindthatdata.com. I write a daily article there about the kind of work that I do. Those are probably the two best places to find me. Nice, nice. Guys, you can find the links in the description below to the Twitter account. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. Love it. You share a lot of value. I love learning from you. I enjoy it. You know, so valuable insights. Guys, you need to follow Kevin because you can see a lot of value. Okay, love you. See you. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here today.